Hey, 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 what's up out there, fellow listeners? Welcome back to the flip side where we do talk sports, everything else. I'm Clint Collins along with Seth Nell. How we doing there, everybody out in the world? We uh, we have the great um, disprivilege this week of bringing you an ACC preview <laughs> for college football. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny because, you know, I'll admit that I don't watch a lot of ACC football. I watch... Uh, Every other conference I watch like pretty obsessively. I watch the SEC to kind of hate on it. Obviously, I watch the Big 12. You know, I watch the Big 10. Um, I watch the PAC and usually have a lot of fun with PAC games late night. And the ACC for me kind of just gets lost in the shuffle. I watched a lot of Florida State football the last two years. But now, I mean, I really don't even know where I stand with it, to be honest with you. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, look at the ACC. The only way you get to watch, the reason they get their games watched is because they have exclusive Thursday night rights. So. <laughs> that's that's the only game on. So, if you want to watch football, it's something you can tough through. I mean, at the end, of the day, I, it, it's true. I um, it, it's bad football. I mean, it's not. Uh, no disrespect, but you know, when your team, when when you've got a division where your predicted winner every year is Georgia Tech. I'll put it this way: when I typed in to do this research, like, and I put this off, I procrastinated like it was history homework, and like when I. Got finally to it, and I typed in on Google, I was like, uh, preseason ACC 2015 poll. The first 10 things that popped up were basketball polls. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. Google it right now. Well, like, it's, you know, it's always funny because here's a, here's a funny, you know, thought process, and this is how I look at the ACC. You know, SEC schools in basketball outside of Kentucky pretty much get sucked into we're football schools. Big Ten schools, for the most part, the same way. I mean, even though the Big Ten's pretty dominant in basketball, they're still sucked in as predominantly known as football schools. It, the ACC is the exact opposite. Yeah, <laughs> Their football programs fight, man, I don't want to go to a basketball school. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, um... <sighs> Well, I guess we should get started. <laughs> let's you know, let's um, get her done here. Let's start with this, though. Let's make it somewhat interesting. Why won't Notre Dame just join this conference? I mean, do you realize that basically what Notre Dame has treated the ACC like is like it's side woman, like it's side chick? Right. Like, it's like, I'll hang out with you. It's their side piece. Yeah, I'll hang out with you like four times this year, you know? We're right. going to hang out like four dates, everything else. And when I'm there, I'm all yours, babe. Right. But I just want to let you know, I'm still dating her and her and her. I'm getting paid all the time. Exactly. And you guys get none of my money, but I'll come show up. The ACC is so like it's Notre Dame's it. escort service it uses to help bolster its strength of schedule, which is hilarious to think about. Yeah, I mean, again, <laughs> the, the problem with that whole situation is, first of all, look, monetarily speaking, if Notre Dame joins the ACC with their basketball money along with the power of Notre Dame, the whole thing of, oh, we have our own, you know, NBC, we got exclusive rights for TV, and hey, we make more money than everybody else, look, that money's going to even itself out. I don't care how you look at it. I mean, if they join them, they're going to command top dollar no matter what. People are still going to want to watch Notre Dame because they're Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame hurts themselves every single year. Why do you want to play the murderous schedule that you play? Florida State, Stanford, USC, Michigan State, um, and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. Georgia Tech. You know, all of these teams, I mean, their schedule is, is pretty, I mean, Notre Dame's schedule is good. I mean, they're, they're, you can't say Notre Dame plays cream puffs because they go out and play, but you're hurting yourself. You're not ever getting in the playoff. You've got to run the table to get in the playoff. And against probably one of the five toughest schedules in college football. You know what's funny about Notre Dame? As I did a look, you know, like, when you talk about the national following that is Notre Dame, I mean, you've got, and, you know, you think about it, and you, you remember uh, some of the great Notre Dame players of all time. You've got Joe Montana, you know, Tim Brown, you know, mm -hmm. you, you've got these, and they've had seven Heisman winners. But what I didn't realize until I really researched this school this last week is they've only played in 34 bowl games in their entire history. I'm going to put it this way. Texas Tech has played in two more. Texas Tech didn't even join the Southwest Conference until the 70s. I mean, that, that's a big thing. I mean, also everybody has to understand, I mean, prior to from the, oh, let's look at it. I mean, basically, when Lou Holtz decided I don't want to do, I don't want to coach Notre Dame anymore and I want to leave and go to South Carolina for some odd reason I can't imagine. Yeah, but, that's really strange. Um, you know, the reality is, is once he left for 
I mean, two decades. They were terrible. They were, two, they were, they were really, terrible. Really bad. Really bad. I mean, you had one year here, one year here. Charlie Warris had, you know, one or two decent years with somebody else's players, ultimately. And, uh, you know, it, it was just bad, it, you know. And, and I just don't... It, Notre Dame is probably one of the traditionally speaking most overrated college football programs that there are. What's interesting you say that they have won eleven national titles, but the NCAA does not recognize two of them. They don't recognize the one from nineteen thirty eight or nineteen fifty three, and I like to call this the Star Wars prequel syndrome because <laughs> I myself do not include uh, Episode one or two in my thought of what Star Wars is. Um, and I'm also now, sidebar, I'm really, really excited about the Star Wars movie. It's like the first time since 1983 we've had a chance at a great Star Wars movie. Men at Work had the number one song in the nation in 1983. I mean, that just like kind of like put your, put your mind around that. <laughs> like, you're a Star Wars guy, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think about the prequels? They in? They out? Do you like them? Uh, I'm going to go with, I'm a fan of two. A lot of people not a fan of two. Fan of... You like uh, all the conferences? Well, I mean, it's just, I like the build up there. Okay. Three, it's okay. One, eh. exactly. See, Charger Banks, really? Yeah, I that's know, bad. This is what the ACC football does. We just sidebarred on Star Wars in the middle of a football podcast. All like, right, main let, cards. Let, let's get let's get to some football all football right. stuff here. First, so wait. Notre Dame. All right, let me finish up on this. Greg Bryant is gone because of great issues. This just came out. Right. He is not eligible until October now, and that's if he makes a better than a B plus in this class that he's in. Mm-hmm. So. That's a big loss at running back for them. Can they recover? I mean, Ohio State, the poll that came out today, the um, I guess the, the AP poll, mm-hmm. the first, they're ranked fourth in the nation right now. Yeah, I don't know about that one. I mean, that's that's a little much for me. Look, Malik Zaire is, is the real deal. He's a player. I mean, like Everett Golson, not like Everett Golson, this is just what I'm going to tell you. Everett Golston took your team undefeated to a national championship game. Missed a year. Missed a year. Came back. Had your team undefeated till they played Florida State. They lose. Yeah. Then they just go downhill from there. This kid is so good that that guy had to transfer and go to Florida State. And right. He's going to be Florida State's starting quarterback. So wait, wait, wait. But is he? Is he? Or is Sean McGuire going to get that starting job? We'll get there in a second. But the reality is that that kid's the real deal. He's from Ohio. I know. A lot about him. I followed him real well. Ohio State wanted him very badly. Chose to go to Notre Dame. Um, he's a good player. He's he, he's going to be an upgrade for them at that position. Now on defense, that kid they got, Jalen Smith, that plays outside linebacker for them, he's the real deal. Yeah, he's he, really He might good. be the best linebacker in all college football. Yeah, really. I mean, he, he, I'm, I'm an Ohio State homer. We got a couple good ones, but that kid's, you know, he's the real deal. I um I guess saying that we can move into Florida State right now. Like you said, you have Everett Golson, who's been to a national title game with another program. By the way, two days ago was Cap was on photo, or I guess was photographed and put up on Instagram of him at a quarterback camp wearing a Notre Dame shirt. Well, I mean, I guess he did graduate from there. In all fairness, so right, I mean, like, he can do whatever he wants to. But you know, you got that, and then we also have Sean McGuire over here. Um, Sean McGuire won a game at Clemson last year, right? Uh. Sean McGuire's name also makes me think of, like, an actor playing a Bond villain. That's what I think of when I hear his name. Well, let me ask this question. And this is what I'm going to pose to you. I agree with you. Sean McGuire won a game against Clemson. That's all good. Everett Golson could have went to LSU. He had been the quarterback there. He did not go to Florida State without some sort of promise that he was going to be the quarterback. Man, he would have made all the difference at LSU. You can't tell me that that kid's not going to be the starting quarterback. The only thing that would drive him down now, the one thing that's very, very, very globally known is that Jimbo Fisher's offense is very complex. It is not a simple thing to learn. So if he can pick it up enough that they can go out there and run him out and play, they're going to run him out and play him. The only hope is is that Sean McGuire is sitting there going, please, you can't, you don't know where the X receiver goes. <laughs> please, you don't know where the X receiver goes. I, uh... I know that, like, if you look at Florida State, now, something that would really, 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 like, the things that concern me, and I really feel like that right now we're talking about the cream of the crop in the ACC. I think that's, it's like, I think it's a fair understanding. I mean, leaving Notre Dame out, yeah, I would say yeah. Okay, so, in this first talk of the cream of the crop, because I really think that there are only three teams that we could even loop into this conversation right now, who has a chance of winning the ACC. Right. Um, They lost 155 consecutive games started in the offensive line. 
That's going to be big, especially breaking in a new quarterback. And a new quarterback, exactly. Yeah, and I think that's another reason why, I think that emphasizes again why I think Golson plays. You're going to have to have a guy who can move back there. Yeah. And McGuire, like him, don't like him. I mean, I'm kind of indifferent to him a little bit, but the bottom line is is that Gol- Golson's going to be run- that quarterback's going to be running for his life a couple games. I, there's no doubt about it. Now, something that's really scary, a, a lot of people last year gave Florida State a lot of credit for having a good defense. Uh, what's interesting about that is I almost feel that that is an uneducated look at it because it's the 61st ranked defense in the nation last year, and they played in the ACC. Uh, they give up five now, and a half yards of play. I now, mean, you can't do that. ask me how many teams in the ACC finished in the top 40 on offense last year. I'm going to go one. Two. Two. Florida and they State, had this, Florida State and... Uh, it was Florida State and Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech. Yep, there you go. And so, like, that two, and they had the 61st best defensive team in the country. I, I'm with you. I mean, now look. Can you knock Florida State putting out NFL guys? They got NFL guys. They're, they're they're like the team that you know. They're like the NCAA college basketball team that's got five NBA guys on their team, but they can't win a game. Yeah, you know. And, and the problem is, is that I think that you have this collection of talent, and I don't know. Jimbo Fisher is such a great offensive coach. I don't know how good defensive coaching they have there. Name either who their defensive coordinator is right now off the top of your head. I have no idea. There you go. I don't watch a lot of SEC football though. I understand, but even that. But you would know if it was somebody that you'd heard of. I mean, I, we can go down schools that I don't even care about, and I can name the oh, defense coordinator. The thing that really killed me last year about uh, Florida State is I thought that Jameis Winston was more deserving of the Heisman last year than he was the year before. Oh, he won of, a lot of games for that. Because of just how many games he managed to win. I think that maybe his pushing of the ref, the yelling of the curse words at the poor white girl in the cafeteria, those type of things may have cost him the repeat Heisman. But there's got to be also a sigh of relief if you're Florida State from him leaving. And what's the craziest thing about me is, is like all the antics and everything else that that kid pulled, he seems to me that would be the type to like peace out the second he got the chance. But he originally tweeted, I'm coming back to Florida State, and rumors everywhere. Like, and then he like the next day came out and said, I'm going pro. Everything I heard from everyone, and I'm talking about like a team doctor that I've got is very close to that school, maybe even is at that school, told me that they. Florida State freaked out and pushed him out, but he was serious. He was coming back to school. I don't know about all that. I mean, look, when you're talking about first player in the draft money, I mean, I would find it very difficult to believe that Florida State pushed him out the door. Now, whether that's true, not true, whether they wanted him back, didn't want him back, if Jameis Winston said, I'm playing college football, Florida State was going to be like, okay, you know. And again, I'm with you that maybe they didn't want him back, but they weren't. I mean, they weren't throwing that kid out the door. Uh, here's the deal with Florida State: most talent. But here's a big deal: what's going to go on with Dalvin Cook? When he's back in the backfield, well, <clears throat> kind of back in the backfield, minus his suspension that he's on right now. How long is the suspension for? It's indefinite. They got an ongoing crime, criminal case going against him. Oh, that's right. I mean, is he coming back? Is he not coming back? He doesn't play. That's huge. That's that's a huge loss for them because for a team that's going to have a new quarterback, new offensive line, they're going to have great receivers. They've got receivers for days. You, you need to be able to run the football. Dalvin Cook's as good as it gets, probably the best in the ACC. I It always interests me whenever I see kids, squads like this that are constantly in trouble. Their mm-hmm. kids just constantly get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Florida, St- Florida State would be a good example right now because I, for the life of me, cannot figure out how you don't get in trouble. Like... It doesn't make any sense to me. Like, it can't be that hard to keep your nose clean for four years, can it? Wow. Punched a girl in the face. I mean, that's, I mean, that's just what I'm saying. Like, it can't <laughs> be that hard to get yourself out of the situation. That's going to But, you know, uh, look, I mean, that's faulty leadership. You know, I, I, I get tired of hearing the situation where coaches get a break. Well, you can't possibly watch 85 kids. I get it. You have one problem. That's an argument. Two, okay, uh, I can still back you on that. You start seeing a repetitive process of problem after problem after problem after problem after problem. And I've always been a firm supporter of coaches. Look, I was a college athlete. I, I know what it's like. I know what my, co- my coach could see and couldn't see. You know, we got away with things we probably never should have gotten away with. You know, we skirted on, you know, things we never should have skirted on. You know, that type of thing. But the reality is at some point there has to be some culpability at the top of the, top of the chain. 
it's your responsibility to watch these kids. It's your responsibility to put them in a position to keep them out of trouble. And when you have to put a moratorium on all football players going to a bar, ever, period. No football player in Florida State is allowed to go to a bar at all. Or it's automatic team suspension. You know there's a problem. There that. is. Um, that reminds me. Remind me to, uh, there's one thing that I want to hit on that's completely off subject when we get through the ACC here, speaking of that. Moving on. Let's go to Clemson, because I think that that's 1B, Florida State's 1A. Yeah, I think Clemson's going to win the end of winning the league. Yeah, I mean, there's might. He might. I mean, um, Deshaun, Wat- Deshaun Watson, I mean, we got him back. I mean, last year he missed, um, what, like half a season with a torn ACL? Yeah, I mean, he was up and down, injury here, injury there, but he showed a lot of flashes as a true freshman. He was a big-time recruit. Um, I just like, to be honest with you, one of the guys I actually like in college football is Dabo Sweeney. I, like, I don't know if it's his accent that just drives me nuts, and, you know, like, Makes me think that the guy's just a good old boy. I like Dabo Sweeney. I like Clemson's program. I think that, you know, they do have a little bit of a... They lost their offensive coordinator. Obviously, he's the coach at SMU now. They lost Vic Beasley and Grady Jarrett. Yeah, I mean, they they lost a lot. But at the same time, they recruit real well. And I think Deshaun Watson is kind of that next evolution of, you know, next best thing in college football at quarterback position. You know, i got to be real good. In the In the half season that he played last year, I mean, he threw 14 TDs, had 1,500 yards passing, uh, and he was a five-star signee yeah, out of high school. Yep. So, I mean, that's possible. You know, um, I feel like that Clemson is a real shot. You've got Clemson with a couple tricky games, though. Uh, the South Carolina game that we talked about last week, um, you know, and it was well this one. You've got that, uh, you know, Notre Dame is coming to Clemson. That should be a really big game for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got to play Florida State. Um, Clemson has probably one of the trickier, t- you know, schedules in the nation now that I think about it. Yeah, so. they got a tough schedule. I mean, look, I just like them. I mean, it, 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 for me, it's pick, it's flip a quarter. You know what I mean? you got a Florida State team that's has a lot of turnover, change, turmoil, all of those things. Probably superior talent overall, 1-85 to 85 than anybody else. I believe that Clemson has the single best offensive player dynamically in Deshaun Watson than anybody else, and they're always good on D. So, yeah, I think it's Clemson's year in the ACC, if that means anything. Yeah, but yeah, they have a I great like place to play also. Yeah, you they know? do. I mean, that's a, that's a really tough place to go in and play. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fortunately for them, the way that their schedule lines up, most of those tough games are at home this yeah, year. Yeah, they got, they got a lot of them at home. I like that. I, again, I, I can't say anything. We've, we're we on record beginning in this podcast. I feel like that we let all the listeners down out there because we just kind of shot down the AZC before we started. But, you know, by default, by just, hey, pick a name out of a hat, you know, here's three teams, which one do you think is going to win? I, I'm going with Clemson. I think that Clemson's greatest challenge, because I do think the rebuilding process at Florida State will, I think they'll lose a few games. That mm-hmm. they Because... Last year, they almost lost games. Then if Jameis Winston's not playing, they maybe lose four or five games last year. Oh, easily. And so I think that we have the shot this year. I think Clemson will win. I think their best competition is Georgia Tech just because of the offense Georgia Tech wins and how tough it is to come, like prepare for them on a one-week thing. Exactly. I mean, you see teams like Navy. Look, Navy wins a lot of football games. Goes to a bowl game every year. <clears throat> Beats teams they shouldn't. Plays BCS teams. I mean, not BCS. I'm calling BCS. Power five teams very tough. Why is that? Because they run the triple option, and you don't see it every week. Georgia Tech is the best in the country to run at running the triple option, so they do it better than anybody else. And it's hard to scheme for them. They have good athletes. They've always got good defenders, good pass rushers. You know, you know Georgia Tech's a good team. They're 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 the team that's going to win because of the style of football that they play. They're never they're never they're never going to win less than nine games. I um, I agree with you completely, especially in the division they're in. Like, the best competition for them, I think it's Pittsburgh and Virginia Tech that you're dealing with down there. Uh, I mean, I like a lot of people like Louisville right now. And here's the deal. Like, Louisville, I don't... I mean, is is Reggie, like, Bontman, is Kyle Bolin, is Tyler Fur- Who's going to be their quarterback? Pick one. It's Bobby Petrino. It doesn't matter. Exactly. My, my, my point is, is look, <laughs> I've had this conversation with you many times. I'm not a, the biggest Bobby Petrino fan. I don't agree with his... Life? Life. Just how he is and how he carries himself and what he does. The things that he's done just don't match up with my own personal thought process on how you live your life. It's okay. You know what I mean? But when it comes to winning football games, why do you think the guy gets jobs? Oh, he knows how to coach. He knows how to win. To me, Petrino is the guy that girls have to block on their Snapchat, probably. 
because of the snaps that he sends them being mm-hmm. that inappropriate. Like, right. he's that scary to me. You know, like, it's funny because you think about, like, the teachers and everything. Like, I, I wouldn't want to send a little girl of mine to college anywhere where Bobby Petrino is just in the off chance that he might meet her. Like, you know, because that could spend, let's like the end times for him. I mean, he got caught dating someone, like, 57 years younger than him, bro. Well, I mean, but look, that goes on every day. That's not even necessarily my concern as much. I'm more looking at... That guy offers kids scholarships, pulls their scholarships at the last minute. He coaches an NFL team and walks out eight games into the season and says, I quit. You yeah. know, the guy has this pattern of behavior, elitism, I think, to a point of how he feels about himself and his abilities. He's top notch. He's a top notch college football coach. Why, why does he keep getting job after job after job? Because he wins games. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give all of our listeners a special treat here. I don't know how many of you know the real story. Alleged, real story okay. of what happened to Petrino at Arkansas, but I will tell you that in all the pictures and everything else you saw, you never saw a picture of the girl, you never saw a picture of the motorcycle, and what I was told on man, this is such a good. I can't name this source. He'll never talk to me again. But like uh, this guy may or may not play basketball at Arkansas. This guy may or may not have played in the NBA for ten years. So. He told me that what really happened was the girl that Petrino was talking to uh, just so happened to be engaged to the uh, strength and conditioning coach, which, you know, is also out in the press, everything else. And he found out about it and why Petrino was in the weight room. He got beat up badly. Like, I couldn't think, I couldn't quote what he said there because this is a censored podcast, obviously, keeping it G-rated for the entire family. But... That is what I was told, like, verbatim. And I've never shared that story. I guess that this is just given a gift to listeners. We are, by the way, always going to drop some inside in- intel whenever we can, whenever I feel safe enough. And that, that story was told to me five years ago now, so I feel like the moratorium on has ended, and then I can say it. But I, I definitely did hear that. I mean, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, that goes back to, like, the elitism thought, okay? Every guy in the world has known a woman in their life that they've been highly attracted to. Attracted to, attracted to, wanted to date, been impressed, but they date the big, you know, the dude you just don't want to meet in a dark alley, the guy that you never want to mess with. Yeah. And everybody just kind of like, I'm smart enough, yeah, I don't want to walk down that path, and they just turn the other way and they go find somebody else, okay? But not Bobby Petrino. No. His, his hubris doesn't allow that. No. You know? <laughs> It just doesn't. But, and that, but that's how he approaches his life, and I just can't buy into it. I can it, see but. Bobby Petrino, like, in uh, some sort of, like, you know, Greek world, where he's, like, uh, like sitting there, and he's, like, you know, has the choice in front of him of, like, Aphrodite or, like, Medusa, and he's, like, she seems dangerous. I like her. I like her that. hair's a little cool. <laughs> like, what's like, and I'm Bobby Petrino. And I'm so Bobby Petrino's son. son, son he Bobby drops Petrino. his mic and goes towards Medusa. <laughs> yeah. Like, um... We have, uh, we have. I mean, like you know, when you look at it, like um, it's kind of like let's let's talk about some of the players in the ACC. Let's talk about some of the people that are. I mean, we've, ta- of- we've pretty much talked about the four teams that are worth really talking about. Yeah, I. Do, I mean, we could sit there and tell you that I can tell you Duke will be down this year. All right, like don't expect Duke to play in a bowl game anywhere near New Year's Eve this year. I think that. Um, like, I mean, it's it's almost like we should talk about these players, to be honest with you. Like, uh, best players in defense in the ACC, in your opinion. Best player on defense in the ACC? I mean, well, I think the I think the the overall consensus pick is going to be Jalen Ramsey. Jalen Ramsey. Florida State. I mean, he it, can play, like, seven positions. Great player. I think he's kind of the, you know, he's the stud of that scenario. I think he's the guy that everybody talks about. This is one thing I'll say about the ACC. Let's give the ACC one prop, one, one thing. Okay. Number one, A, they put out NFL guys yeah. for as bad as their teams are. So I think talking about individual players is a good thing because there are actually there are a bunch. pretty in- some interesting players on teams that aren't very good. Dude, I, I pulled out four defensive players that like I myself would keep an eye on as first round draft picks. Like uh Jalen Ramsey, like you said. I mean, mm-hmm. something to watch about him. I mean, he basically plays like a rogue like spy. I mean, you'll see him sometimes covering their best receiver on the corner position. You'll see him out in the defensive backfield sometimes. Sometimes he plays like a spy linebacker. I mean, that dude floats the field. I'll give you, I'll give you a uh, NFL comparison. Do it. Ed Reed. Ed Reed. 
See? Like, he's worth watching. Guys, okay, look. We're trying to get hype about the ACC now. All right, there's one. Uh, second, you know who I love? And we'll get to see him early on in the season when they play Ohio State. Kendall Fuller, cornerback out of Virginia Tech. Good player. Good player. You know, he's from the Fuller family, you know, so I know he can play a little D. I'm with you there. Uh, I like Shaq Lawson from Clemson. Shaq Lawson's a very good player. I like Shaq Lawson from Clemson. And here's another thing about Clemson. They always got D linemen. They do. And they really do. I mean, it's almost sickening to a point because a a lot of schools struggle at D-line. Like, that's the position where they'll have a really good D-line for a while, and then you'll see a drop-off for yeah. a couple of years so they can bring some guys up. It's not Clemson. It's like, you lose Daquan Bowers, Vic Beasley shows up. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, you lose Vic Beasley, you got Shaq Lawson. I mean, they always got somebody to put some pressure on the quarterback. They always got good guys in the trenches. I like him a lot. I, uh... I really like, you know, speaking of this team, Duke may only win five games this year, but Jeremy Cash will be worth watching. Well... You know, you know, I got a little. Uh, I know you do. Little, here's the deal. Jeremy Cash, Ohio State guy, originally yeah. transfer left, left Ohio State, went to Duke. Look here, I, I'm happy for Jeremy Cash because of all of all the reports and all the things out of Columbus, it was never a negative thing why he left Ohio State. They were recruited right over top of him, and he went to Duke and he became a player, which is a great thing. And I'm happy for the kid, but he just was never going to play at Ohio State. The writing was on the wall. So he went to Duke, and he made a career himself. And he is a good player, and I like him a lot. He's a top. He's a he's top three round draft pick. And something else about Jeremy Cash, in I he's smart as all get out. And I was about to say, did you know that in May he finishes his master's degree? Yeah, he's smart. That that is a kid right there. I mean, that, that is that's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I mean he's uh, a, he's big time in, in anything, not just football. Good for him. Good, I, you know, very I, good for him. I'm one of those people that even though again, where's my Homer Bell? Ding 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 ding. ding yeah. Ding, you know, I'm an Ohio State fan. Even if you leave Ohio State, love to watch, um, you know, guys that leave Ohio State leave the program transfer somewhere else because, A, they're not going to play or just wasn't a good fit. I like to see them do good because if, at some point you were part of the family. So, you know, I'm, I'm down with that. I, I'm usually like that. It's just a shame that people like Deuce Bellow transfer to Missouri and still never play. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so the last person I'll bring up on defense off the top of my head also at Florida State is their safety Nate Andrews like I really like that kid and I think that he covers the field well I think that he is uh, somebody that doesn't let people get behind him very often um, you're not he's somebody that doesn't get burnt deep a lot like I feel like he uh, he knows how to play um, protection coverage especially in backing up the corners on crossing routes okay. pretty um, but I mean offensive you know what's really sad golly the ACC what is wrong with you uh, when you bring up offensive players it just it just pains me to even talk about them because I wonder what would these kids look like on good offenses? Like, would they be good or are they are they overvalued where they are? Because, you know, you bring up Deshaun Watson and I know that you're like a big, big fan of him. Mm-hmm. So tell me. Deshaun Watson, is he if if you stick him on Ohio State, is he a great quarterback? Oh, absolutely. And I think you could put look, I mean, it doesn't matter who plays quarterback at Ohio State. I mean, they're good. They're loaded. That's just what that is. But look, I think Deshaun Watson's a special player anyway. I think he's a he's a he's a program changing player. You put him on a team that's a five hundred team, they're immediately now a nine and three, ten and two type team. His talent is that good. Um, I think he's one of the best players in the country. I think he's gonna be player of the year in the ACC this year. I'm going out with that one. I think he's going to and you know, surprising thing if you want me to throw it out there. Um, I will say, I think he'll be sitting. I think he'll be a Heisman finalist. Okay, I, I really do. I think. I think. I really think that he is because I think that he's just going to have the the set. He's going to play in a lot of big games. He's going to be on a team that's going to be a conference championship type team, whether it be in the ACC or not. I think he's going to put up some good numbers. So I mean, he's going to be on. He's going to be on prime time all the time because they do play a very decent schedule. I really think that the Heisman candidate out of the ACC, and you brought him up in our conversation before we started doing the pod, was uh, I think Tyler Boyd, that uh, yeah. wide receiver out of Pittsburgh. That I think he's good. their Heisman candidate. I, I, the problem is I don't know what, what Narduzzi is going to do, being their new coach. You know, I like Pitt. I told you they're kind of my sleeper team in that conference. I said on that side of the division, I think they're going to win it. I think they just, by default, basically, I think it's going to be they're going to finish 5-3 and three and, and win that division. But it, Boyd's great. He's oh. got to sit out the first game of the year, suspended yeah. for DUI. It, he's going to catch a lot of passes, but I also think Pitt's going to get into a lot of, you know, sloppy twenty. Day, you got to remember, Narduzzi, Narduzzi comes from Wisconsin. 
So it, it, that's not where I think his Heisman's won, though. I'm talking about that kid last year averaged 27.6 yards of kickoff yeah. return and 11 per punt return. Kid can make yards. Last anywhere. time a receiver won the Heisman. Oh man, I'm not saying he can win it. I'm just saying I think he'll be a finalist. When's the last time? Okay, so when's the last time a receiver won the Larry Fitzgerald? Did he win? No. Nah, who did then? I don't. Tim I, Brown, I think. Didn't we talk about last week about how Char- we forget Heisman? Are we, are we talking about Charles Woodson? Maybe are you considering him a wide receiver in college? I couldn't play him. Tim, I think Tim Brown's the last guy I can remember that played wide receiver. That we talked about how irrelevant the Heisman winner, the Heisman Trophy winner, actually is. Yeah, but I mean, but but that's but that is the benchmark of college football. Whether we agree it to be or not, it's still what the benchmark and everybody looks at is. I think the child wants to be fine. It's just watered down, and I, I blame ESPN. I blame the ESPYS for watering down the Heisman because it's just kind of like how. The uh, Oscars used to be a much bigger deal before also came 14 other movie award shows to where now, like, you can win Best Picture over here, but maybe you don't win it over here. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, when you've got a quarterback that wins the Heisman but doesn't win the Quarterback of the Year award, like, it's David really... David O'Brien award? Yeah, yeah like, I can't it's figure really that out. weird to me. Like, well, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a scenario in our society. I mean, look, here's the deal. My, you know, you know Angel, my, my girl, love her to death... Her son, he's nine, going to be ten, getting a call. Elite basketball team wants him to come play in a practice, wants him to try out for their team. They saw him playing, you know, and they called me directly. They want me to bring him out there, right? I, I talked to the guy. I said to him, I said, one thing. I said, this is a select basketball team. I don't believe in every kid gets a ribbon. So I don't care if he doesn't play because he's not good enough to play. But the last thing I want is every kid to play the same amount of minutes because it's every kid gets a ribbon. I'm not, I'm not with that. I don't believe that's a good way. To, and that's what college football award specials have become. Oh, you know what's funny is that you bring that up. And I had decided to skip this joke, but you may even come back to it. When I look at ACC in football, I think of like, I first saw it when I was staring at it on my computer screen, just ACC. And the thought that ran through my head was like, all children count? Like, kind of like a participation program where mm-hmm. no child left behind. That's, like, what I saw the ACC being. <laughs> like, it's just, it's so painful. Um, and, I mean, the names, the Coastal, and what's the other one? Atlantic, I think. Atlantic, like, golly, like, I know any ACC fan right now is probably pulling their hair out. But, man, look in the mirror. Be honest with yourself. Like, this look, is not a good conference. I, I'm going to tell you right now. Here's a couple things. We can talk about it all day. But... Let's go back to some of the other players. We haven't touched on some of the other, some of the other players. Jacoby Brissett. Okay. Back to it. NC State. Jacoby Brissett. He has a legitimate shot at playing at the next level. He does. And in and, and a good season last year. He had a very good season. Terrible last year. team. Awful team. Good season. No help. I watched I watched a couple of NC State games last year just because I wanted to watch him play, you know, has he because he transferred from Florida and I just wanted to see him. Because you know, you get that kid who didn't get didn't start at Florida or didn't start at a big program, but he was a big recruit. And you and you so wonder sometimes is it sour apples? Because I was looking at the quarterbacks at Florida last year, and none of them were better than Jacoby yeah. Brissett. <laughs> none of them. That was a really weird situation. Florida, man, what a dumpster fire. What is up with all the Atlantic Coast schools, man? Like um, uh, here you go. You know one team we haven't touched on yet? Who? Miami. Okay. We just had we've had a thirty minute conversation about AC, AC, ACC football. And we haven't even touched Miami, one of the iconic football programs forever. Everybody's seen the ESPN, the U, put out more NFL guys than I can possibly imagine. When I was growing up, it was the U, the U, the U, the U. When I was in high school and college, that's when they were going through their glory days and their glory years. And, like, they're terrible. Man, you know what's funny is they may finish in the top half of the ACC and they may win six games. Like what? What I can't what I can't figure out is what's the problem. You live your 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 University of Miami. You've got more NFL guys like like the gener, kid today's generation. You tell me one school that has more NFL guys that today's youth. You know what I mean? High school kids today can say Ray Lewis was my hero. Ed Reed was my hero. Andre Johnson. You know, so on. You know, Clinton Portis. You know, Willis McGahee. This guy, that guy. All these guys. You know, Jeremy Shockey. You know, uh, Kellen Winslow. All, all the players that they've had over this. I mean, Jonathan Vilma. I mean, so on. It just goes forever and a day. We can sit here and talk about this, but that group of guys that are still either just finishing up their NFL career, the late of their prime, or recently retired. These are who all these high school kids looked up to. 
How come they can't get players? I don't know. I, uh... I, w- I wonder about that, too. Is it just because of how much trouble they've been in? I mean, it, it I, seems I, like I they had know. a little flare-up a couple years ago, didn't they, that they were ranked, like, top ten for a little while? Yeah, they got up to... I think they got up to... I think they finished 9-3 and three in, like, 2013, and you thought... And then they were 6-7 and seven last year. Yeah. I mean, that, this is the thing I can't figure out. It's so perplexing to me, because you would think that with all... Michael Irvin, with all these guys, all these big-time alums, they'd figure out a way to get guys... Who, and it's in Miami. I know. We're talking South about... Beach. My, like, South I Beach. can go to college in South Beach. This is... Stinks. I don't know that I want to go there. That wouldn't be fun by any stretch. I mean, I, I can't get it. And you, they got a good university. Miami has a good school. They're a good school academically for the most part in a lot of different fields. You know, it's also they have one of their most famous alums. I mean, my goodness, we're watching him every week right now in his new HBO show. Uh, because Dwayne The Rock Johnson definitely was their starting <laughs> defensive guy. Like, the thing is, is that and a lot of people don't realize this. Like, Dwayne The Rock Johnson... Like, was a four-star recruit out of high school, right? And he started at Miami. Like, he started Could at Miami. Play in the league. Got hurt, and Warren Sapp replaced him. He went to the bench with an injury. Warren Sapp, the, the younger guy behind him, came out. Dwayne Johnson never saw the field again. Right. And then he became a wrestler. But, like, to me, that's, like, my favorite Miami story because I kind of rooted against them when they were good. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, But I understand you rooting, but I, that's not even where I'm getting at here. Can you believe that we talk? You tell me that in what world you would ever say two people would have a conversation about ACC football and for a half hour they wouldn't say anything about the University of Miami. I mean, it just happened. And it's probably happening all over the country right now. But it perplexes me. Doesn't it? That, I think, is a storyline. I mean, what, what happened? I mean, they went through problems and problems and we get it, violations and this and that and this scandal and that scandal and that scandal. But they're not in trouble anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you look at it every year. Here's the other thing. They have more decommitments every year yeah. than any college. I know. Their, it's hilarious. I mean, right now, they, they've got, they'll have 20 commits going into the senior year, senior, and they will lose 10 of them. Yeah. You and then know they'll, the they'll get them back in somebody else, but nobody near as good as the kid they lost. You want to know how the best way to recruit players late in the recruiting season? Recruit who is committed to Miami. Right, like, correct. That's they're the best flipping. way to do it. Right, you need a, hey, man, we need a running back. Who's got Miami guys committed to them? <laughs> I, uh, I guess that, you know, uh, bold prediction time. Um, and then I, I want to, we got another thing to hit on, you know, right after this on the ACC thing before we, like, get out of here. Uh, one bold prediction for me is I really think that there's a chance, as awful as the ACC is, because of which ACC teams play SEC teams this year, that there could be a 500 record against the SEC. I hear you. Because you got Clemson and South Carolina. That's, a, that's the coin flip. I, I, called, the coin I, called flip. It, I called it last week. I told you, Spurrier wins one game every year. That he shouldn't win. That he shouldn't win. That is what people remember, and that's what keeps his job coming back every year. Yeah. I mean, and he, he's going to get... And, and, I'm telling you, that could be the game. I, now, whether it'll be that, I love, I love Clemson, so I don't think it happens. But it's not out of the realm of possibility by any stretch. <laughs> what, uh, what's your prediction? One bold prediction. Oh, one bold pred- prediction? I have it. The ACC will be the only, team, only conference with a team that does not win a game against an FCS school. I guess you're talking about, yeah? Yeah. Wake Forest. Wake Forest. <laughs> <laughs> Wake Forest. We'll win one game, man. It and was, they play. They play Elon the first game of the year. They will not win an FCS game all year long. It, it's you know, like when you're looking through this conference stuff and you're just trying to find things to talk about. It's easier to find the Ark of the Covenant than it is a preview of the way conference football team this year. Like no one cares. Like they have been disavowed out there. I'm pretty sure. Like wait, wait. Wow. You know, it's funny because you know there for a couple years Wake had some good football teams. Yeah. Okay. Um. They had the they had Matty Mock's older brother played quarterback for him yeah. for a couple years um, before he went to Cincinnati and he was good led him to a couple then they went to a couple eleven one seasons they when they see went to a couple New Year's Day bowls or whatever and that's when Wake Forest's basketball program had gone from this huge you know awesome Tim Duncan days and Randolph Chris Children's. Paul days and Randolph Children's days and to just being the toilet of the yeah. ACC in basketball I think we're seeing the shift in that. Wake Forest is going back to being the toilet of football, and I see Wake Forest's basketball team making just a little bit of rise because Danny Manning's going to get some players. I hope so. I hope so. All right, all right. Switching away from the ACC, by the way, winner of the ACC, we called it. Um, you're saying that I'm saying Clemson, Clemson, and I'm going with Pitt, and I'm, I'm going Clemson wins going with. I'm going Clemson, Georgia Tech, and I think Clemson wins also. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, 
let's shift. We were just talking about player control and everything else, and I want to bring into a topic that really close to home for us here. Actually, it's eight miles from our from where we are sitting right now. SMU basketball. Oh wow. Let's talk about Larry Brown, what's going on at SMU, and what we think this means for the future of the Mustangs and Larry Brown. Okay. If you guys don't know about the story right now, SMU has been under investigation basically ever since Keith Frazier showed up to campus. Since then, what has happened is Frazier's had to miss games that they didn't, in fact, end up taking the wins back from that he played in. Uh, he became academically ineligible. Academic fraud was what they called it. He maintained himself in school. Came back the next year, the same thing happened again. Uh, you've got... Several players that were supposed to have come to campus that backed out at the last minute, the most notable being Emmanuel Moutier, who went, you know, to China. To China. During that time, they had developed a relationship with Prime Prep that went sour, but de- not before Deion Sanders' child decided to come play football for the Mustangs. Mm-hmm. You had, directly after that, um, SMU itself had switched from an Adidas program to a Nike program, I believe. Mm-hmm. At the same time that Prime Prep switched from an Adidas program to a Nike program. Okay. There have been a lot of stuff in there that that had happened. Actually, Prime Prep's an Under Armour program. Under, okay, I think it got pulled, though. Like, I mean, there's, there's a weird timeline here yeah, where they, you they like, switched. Deion Sanders is hugely backed by Under Armour. Well, so I know that there was, like, a... There's ju- no way Prime, Prep, Prime Prep's been an Under Armour school, though. There's, like there's something, program. and then it was one of the other kids. There's, there's one of the other kids that, like, they're, they're, they switched at the same time that SMU did. I, I might... I mean, we can go to the semantics of that. I mean, let's dig into the real scenario. Okay, the real... Here. Okay, the whole thing is, is, okay, all this is going on. Now, what we now have here is the NCAA basically building an office on the Dallas campus. And they are now looking into them. I mean, they're vetting them hardcore. Like, what came out about the lack of constitutional or uh, institutional control I mean, that's is... The, I mean, that's, that's Bruce Pearl. I mean, that's... Yeah. SM, here's the deal. Larry Brown, what is he, in his mid-70s? Yeah. Okay, he's never going to coach college again. He might get this year in to give them time. He might get to coach this year, maybe. After that, he's done. He, he'll never coach again. You know, and I'm not going to bring up any names, you know that I am very good friends with a highly, highly coveted high school basketball player in the country right now. SMU called his father and he hung the phone up on him. He won't even talk to him. That, it, 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 the word's out. Players were, they were, they were buying, and it was bags of cash heaven going on at SMU. It's done. Academic, whatever you wanted, bags of cash. It's Larry Brown. It's his M.O. It's been his M.O. Since Kansas. It was his M.O. when he was in Kansas. It was, you know, he went to the NBA forever. If anybody didn't see this coming, but it's SMU and they don't care. Because SMU... Has a history of this also. Well, they have a history of it, but even not even that part of it. They're, the one thing I can give SMU alumni is they thirst for winners. The city of Dallas thirsts for winners. Whether it be in football, basketball, sports, athletics, it doesn't matter. I don't care if it's girls field hockey. They want winners. Okay, they got a lot of money. They got big time alums, and big hair. And, and, and big hair. There you go. <laughs> you know, big big Texas. You know, Cadillacs with horns on the front. You know, stuff like that. They they want to win. So, look at some of the coaches they've hired. They hired Matt Doherty after he got fired from North Carolina. Right. So let's bring him. They just want a big name. Larry Brown's on the market. We can have Larry Brown. We'll pay you a bunch of money, Larry. Just get us a winner. We don't care what you do. Don't pay any attention, so on and so forth. SMU, and it's sad too because it has been nice to see SMU be relevant in in our area. It was. A, I'm not going to lie we to live, you. We live three X's from the campus. I mean, it, it, it was a really cool experience to be in Moody to watch a game. Right. They really did a really good job with turning that into a place to see a game. They turned into a place to see a game and. I'll be honest with you, though, their football program is still the worst supported pro. You know, that I don't even know if their students know that there's a game going on inside. I, I, I get the, the greatest story ever, okay? I was dating a girl who was an SMU alum. She went to Cox School of Business. I had just moved to Dallas, been here a couple of years. Um, she's like, I want to go to the homecoming football game at SMU. I was like, sure. I'm like, I, I, you know, I've never been to an SMU football game. I love college. Sure, let's go. Let's check it out. I'm not even joking with you. I could count on my hands and toes how many people were in the whole stadium. Not alumni. I'm talking about in the whole stadium for their alumni football game. 
I have never seen anything like it in my life. I went to an SMU football game for about a quarter, two years ago maybe, mm -hmm. and it was a cold weather game in all fairness. Like it was like one of the games was like really, really cold, nasty weather here in Dallas when we were having like a bit of a cold spell. Um, and it was the same type of experience. Like I literally was able to go to the 50 yard line, go down to the perfect range of view. I spread myself out across three levels of bleachers mm -hmm. and spread my legs wide. And, you know, honestly, you could have done, you could have sparked up a cigar and no one would have said anything to you. Like you could have brought in anything you wanted and no one have said anything to you. Now there's a party on the boulevard. Don't be wrong. Right. Oh, no, no, <laughs> don't lie. The college kids are partying. They just don't care. Like they, they get seen, they look at football like this. Hey, yay, we can party. Da, 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 da. Nobody's going to mess with us. We can throw cars on campus, but they're in no way we're going to watch that football. Game. Exactly. They it's don't just care. Not and like, but and, it, it comes back down to it. And like what we were saying, I think that SMU is about, is the NCAA, what are they going to do to SMU? Is this going to be bad or is it just going to hit Larry Brown? Well, I mean, I think it's going to hit the whole, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you've seen some different things. Like, what happened to Tennessee? Not really much. Nothing. Bruce Pearl got hit with a lot. Yeah. But nothing really happened to Tennessee. I I don't know. I don't know how that's going to go. I, I don't know if it's going to be a repeat offender case, because even though it's basketball and not football, is it going to be a repeat offender case because it's SMU? Is it going to be... I don't know what's going to happen. I just know, the, the only thing I do know for for a fact is Larry Brown's done coaching college basketball. He's out. Um, I saw him at the Peach Jam, sitting in the front row, looking smug as ever, but in the back of his mind, he's like, I'm out. You know, I made my money. I'm good. I'm done. You know, they, it's sad to see. It really if is. S if SMU does get any kind of major, I mean, if, if major things hit them on this, to think about that they just sold all of that for one first round tournament loss. That's what they got from it. Yeah. I mean, if they're going to have a good team this year. They're going to be okay. If, if if they if they can skirt penalties for this year to play, they're going to be all right. I mean, they're not going to be terrible. Um, you know, Nick Moore's back. I mean, they got those guys back. They're going to be okay, but um this is the thing about it that kills me. Syracuse academic fraud for what? 5 year span. Yeah. Gets hit with 15 scholarships lost over a 5 year period. This, in my opinion, is ten times worse than that. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, there, there's things, and again, there's certain things here on, I, I'm not into speculating about things that I don't know about. So I'm not going to get, you know, you, we live here in Dallas, we're in the mix of we hear everything things, goes on, we, we hear, hear it things. all, but, you know, so I'm not going to speculate on some of the things I've heard because I don't want to be erroneously report. I don't want to yeah. pull, pull a Chris Mortensen. Yeah. I'm not trying to erroneously report on things. Um but at the same time, if any of, if even half of that stuff is true, that's the whole thing. Is like I really can't. I've got my sources at SMU. They're they're too close to me to like you know even come out. And like you said, if it ever didn't come out or people try to like back it up on us, that we can't like you know recover from that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've had to pull a podcast before for being not PC Correct. about a certain topic. So right. like you know we uh, we kind of understand that. But I, I will say this: like what he just said, if half of what I have heard is true. Um, about the SMU program right now, then they are in a lot of trouble. They are in a lot, a lot, a lot of trouble. And this is that kind of trouble that, like, you know, there will be a 30 for 30 on. <laughs> right. There's a, this is 30 for 30 trouble. It's the this Pony is. Excess sequel. But, but here's the deal. When you hire a guy like Larry Brown, look, great coach, leads the X's and O's part of it. Great, great coach, whatever, this and that, or whatever, you know, only person ever won an NBA title and a, you know, college title. Whatever the case may be, and you just know something bad's gonna happen. But it, it would be you, like hiring yeah. David Koresh to be your preacher. Cool. Like, why would you do that? Right. Like, no, I'm with you. It's just it's like put it's like putting a wolf in the hen house. You know what I mean? You just it don't is. Do it. You know, and, and Bobby Petrino at a sorority house. <laughs> wow! 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 I uh, oh. I uh, okay, okay. Well, so what? What's this exciting? Is getting pulled. I know, I know. <laughs> what's exciting? What's exciting? And I promise you, is that starting next week, we are actually back to talking about good football. And like as we admitted last week, because of the Big Ten and the Big Twelve loyalty that we have, the SEC is kind of like spit and venom coming from our tongues. Right. But starting next week, we get in the pack. And you know what? I have a soft spot in my heart for the pack because of how late their games are on. And so do I. <laughs> There's nothing better than the. 
you know, 10 o'clock at night game where you've got Arizona playing UCLA and it's sunny out there and it's dark as night over here and you're like, man, it's crazy. And you've been out watching ball all day long, having yeah. a couple beers and it's that late game and it's 